Hi, I'm Dave Bazuki, founder and CEO at Roblox, and you're listening to Tech Talks. Today, I'm joined by special guest Brooks Evans, Vice President and Chief Information Security Officer at Roblox. So, Brooks, thank you so much. This is I'm really excited about the show. Thanks, Dave, and thank, thanks for having me here. I'm excited to talk about some of these things, too. Well, hey, Brooks, let's... Um, maybe just get started with the the foundation of how we came together at Roblox. And if you could just uh, touch base on on where you've been and what brought us together today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I've spent the last quite a few years in the tech industry and uh, working against uh, some pretty interesting uh, threats against uh, uh, people that want to do do harm to, to users and and folks that are they're working on these tech platforms and um i got the opportunity to to get introduced to to dave and the team and uh really learn about the problems that roblox is facing and that's that's intriguing for me it's problems that i wanted to come and help solve um so dave yeah that that's uh that's the backstory of what led me here is just really really cool difficult uh unique problems that, that we get to solve here and I think if people look you up, Brooks, they'll see work in wonderful places like Netflix, Apple, other places where you you learned your craft. A first question, we have so many really smart people on Roblox um, and part of our community, whether they're mischievous or not, are constantly pressing uh, the Roblox platform for hacks, security, edges, when you came on board, was there any benefit to that? And that we've essentially been, you know, under security assault for 16 years on the platform and have hardened a bit because of that. Oh, yeah. So the, I, I think, you know, what's what's interesting about this platform is there's a lot of there's a lot of love for the platform that that also drives a lot of uh, a lot of folks to want to win at games, to really be passionate, um, you know, and that passion sometimes leads people through some misdirection, certainly. Uh, to want to to want to attack the platform to get an edge on uh, the folks that they're competing with, and um, that brings a new set of attacks that, uh, and I, I would say a new level of attack that maybe a lot of other tech companies don't see regularly. Um, so yeah, absolutely, it, it raises the bar when it comes to how good we have to be. Now, now for for many people, security is a big fuzzy thing. Can you share not maybe just for Roblox, but for tech companies as a whole, the specter of the things we have to think about? Um, and, and I'll highlight some that relate to Roblox specifically, but what kind of things are we trying to secure? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's the, the, the well-known things, right? We have a lot of data that we have to secure. We have obviously employees and systems that run our games that we need to keep secure. But um, maybe some of the more, more uh, important things are our users. Um, in addition to that, you know, you think about uh, there's folks who want to uh, break into companies like ours to to make money. There's folks that have a particular ideological stance that they're trying to further. Um, and then we, I would say, on the far end of the spectrum, we even have to deal with nation state threats. Right? We have other um, country, there are countries around the globe who have very different stances on how they deal with um, their citizens and you know platforms like ours. So we have a lot of we have a lot of adversaries to think about. Yeah. And and then there's the whole range of the things we hear about in the news as well that we'll we'll touch on a bit later. Uh, one one thing at Roblox, there is a very active, vivid economy um, on the platform. Brooks, I'm, I'm going to you might not even have heard about this, but I believe it was almost 12 years ago when Roblox was a much smaller company, we didn't have a chief information security officer. There was um, something called, I think it was an, a SQL injection attack on our economy before we had hardened and before we mature. Uh, have you heard about that at all? Yeah, I have. I did did a bit of research before I joined and I've, you know, I've heard some stories and uh, SQL injections, uh, it's still today is, is quite a quite a common attack path to, to go after companies, especially those that are early in kind of their build cycle. Got it. In the case of Roblox way back then, for the ro early Roblox players that might remember it, they will remember for, I believe, 36 hours, we threw that master switch and shut down the whole economy because we didn't want uh, Robux circulating throughout the system. 
And it was, it was a pretty traumatic event. But at the same time, we learned a lot. And there, there's just such a much richer range of fail safes and friction. But it, it is really where we learned about security. Um, hey, and then as you think about just your career in this, and, and it's so compelling, are there any areas that attracted you to the discipline of, of security? Yeah, um, certainly. I think there's there's two things that are quite um, quite uh, drawing when it comes to security. Number one, I really like to build things. I really like to create things. And in order to build and create in security, you have to be on the very edge of what's happening in the industry, especially in technology. Um, that just means that that drives me to constantly be learning. So I think that's probably number one thing. Um, number two, you know the the um, the security industry is mostly about protecting people, protecting companies, protecting users. Um, that protective uh, mission is is a big draw for me and my team as well. Um, throughout the episode, Brooks, I'm going to sprinkle in things I've learned that I hope are right. And I'm going to ask you if are right. One, one level of human fallibility is getting an email that says, emergency, click on this link, something's wrong somewhere, um, or a text that says emergency, call us. And in, in most of these cases, uh, what I have learned is rather than respond to the link, go to the root URL or call the organization directly, just in case what I, where I'm calling or what I'm doing might be the wrong place. Any Is that the right way to go on that, Brooks? Yeah, it certainly is. Yeah, this is what we call phishing. And um, you know, this is where uh, a third party is trying to trick you into doing something, usually by pretending to be a legitimate organization or a legitimate person on the other end. It's always great to to reach out to that person directly instead of through that email, you know, call them up on the phone and say, hey, I got this. I got this strange email. Was that really you? And you see that, you know, you'll see it with your bank. You'll see it with I, I got one the other day from the, from the Postal Service. Right. It's just such a common attack vector today. One that I've heard about, and I almost would like to do a simulation. Brooks, this is Dave from your bank. We've got an emergency going on. Someone's hacked your account. Can you give me the pin for your thing? We need to unlock it. Would you answer in that case, or would you call the bank back at their phone number? Oh, I'd absolutely hang up and call the bank back. And I think the numbers that we've seen um, when when tests like this are run against the public or run against companies like ours, you know, there's a double digit percentage of folks who are probably just distracted in what's going on in their life at the moment, and they'll just respond. Um, so you really do have to bring some skepticism. Um, you know, if you don't recognize the person on the other end of that phone call, um, you, you definitely you definitely want to like hang up and, and call them directly to be sure you're you're talking to the right person. Yep. As we got on the phone, um, you know, we've talked a little about your protecting Roblox. Um, this is an area where the public loves to hear about it in the news, and it's it's interesting um, and at the same time somewhat tragic. And so we 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 want to be ahead of these kind of things. One that just happened. Um, I love Vegas, and it sounds like MGM was shut down for four or five days. Could you? Share a little maybe behind the scenes of how something like that could happen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we've seen uh, a couple of a couple of very similar attacks in, in Vegas recently. MGM and Caesars both um, likely succumbed to the same group, um, which we think started with with a uh, a telephone call to someone in in the company and said, "Hey, you know, acting like they're the employee, right? Say, hey, I've lost my phone. Uh, can you can you help me get back into my system?" and um, really just tricking the person on the other end of the phone into giving them access. That's probably, that's probably step one. Like that's how we think this, this went down. Um, you know, step two, those organizations may have had lots of vulnerabilities in the way their systems were configured and set up. And the attackers then use those vulnerabilities to burrow deeper and deeper into the system. Um, ultimately getting to a place where uh, my assumption is that those, those companies felt like they had to turn things off and, and start over uh, to get things to a safe place. And yeah, as you pointed out, like that caused a massive impact to their business, uh, you know, and their customers and folks who were trying to, uh, you know, probably just enjoy their, enjoy their vacation. Yeah. And then another one that I've heard about 
is something called ransomware. And I've heard about this in hospitals and healthcare. Um, and I guess this is a, it's an industry, right? You lock some system out or something. And then if money has been sent in some way on the web, you unlock. Um, can you share a bit about like the magnitude of that, like how big it is and why maybe why healthcare is targeted? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, ransomware is probably what well, probably what we actually saw in the in the Vegas cases as well. Um, it's certainly what we've seen in a, a number of healthcare settings in the United States recently. Um, speaking from experience, I have family members that are in the, the medical field. Um, you know, hospitals are great in bringing just wonderful technology to bear on fighting disease uh, and helping keep people healthy. Uh, but they're not always on the, the edge of, of technology and in terms of like keeping their systems up to date and running. So they're a pretty soft target. And um, these attackers will will use the softness in their their in their systems to uh, to break in to, to gain access to all of the data, at let's say the hospital or medical facility. And then they'll encrypt that data so it's not usable uh, by that hospital or medical facility. So suddenly they've lost all the data they need to be able to treat patients. And 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 then they they ransom that. They say, you know, we'll unlock this for you if you'll give us X number of millions of dollars. Are these ones or fives or tens? I think they're tens to, you know, 50 million kind of in range. Um, and sometimes that's reasonable and the, the organization will pay that pay that ransom and sometimes um, they won't. And what you see then is these facilities are down, which means that patients are getting shipped to to other uh, other facilities for treatment. And they even see they've looked and they see they see patient mortality going up, uh, you know, at these facilities. Is there any philosophy where if you're running a hospital, you actually have to assume this is going to happen in some way? and assume you might not be able to pay the ransomware. So you have to run at a, a heightened level because because that if you assume you might not be able to pay it, then you, then it like heightens your security in a way. Yeah, you, you hope so. You hope that, um, you know, the leaders of these the leaders of these organizations are, are thinking about what do I do to prepare when this happens to our facility? And you hope that they're backing things up and storing their data in a different place so that it can't be ran, you know, can't be encrypted and ransomed. Um, there's definitely things, steps they can take. It's just an industry that doesn't have a lot of that experience so far. Um, good. Now, now I want to work into uh, personal tip number two. There was a time, I don't know if, if it's still really dangerous, but there was a time five to 10 years ago, if you took a USB thumb drive and plugged it into certain computers, they might actually launch an executable or do things on command. Um, is that still a danger? Um, Rogue, Rogue USB might launch some code or something? Yeah, it certainly is. Um, that attack hasn't gone away. Um, you know, you, you, hear these, you hear these attacks where where a, a, an attacker has strewn a few USB drives in the parking lot of the business that they want to attack. And someone at that business will pick that drive up and think, oh, someone lost this. Let me see what's on it. And that's kind of how that attack unfolds. So the lesson might be if you ever find a USB drive you don't recognize, it's dangerous to even try to figure out what's on it. It sounds like. Yeah, that's right. That's a, that's a throw it in the trash moment. Um, you can assume that it has, uh, you know, it has has some disease on it that you don't want your uh, you don't want your computer to catch as well. And as you mentioned, human vulnerability, which is we just have to expect no matter how much we learn, we may always accidentally plug that in. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that, that's, um, you know, from an attacker point of view, if you're trying to attack a business who has really good controls around their environment, you need to get something into that environment. And the easy way of doing that would be to get an employer, to get a contractor of the business to carry that code, that, that malicious code in on a flash drive, plug it in. Um, yeah, we did see those attacks, you know, against some of our energy sector. We saw it against, uh, as you mentioned, nuclear facilities, even elsewhere in the world. Okay, cool. So, um, so what have you seen evolve um, and how have you seen information security change 
um, over the time that you've been involved with this really interesting discipline? Yeah, there's um, there's quite a bit that, that's evolved. This, this industry moves really fast. Um, it's always the struggle between the attacker and the folks trying to defend. Um, and, you know, I think some of the things that have changed, especially in the recent past, we've seen machine learning being used to really get great at targeting the right people. Um, we've seen artificial intelligence used to make the uh, either to make the, uh, the initial attack seem really convincing, whether that's through, you know, mimicking a person or their voice or their, their video of a person, or it may just be in, in using that artificial intelligence to make it easy to attack a large number of people and really customize that attack to fit each of those businesses, each of those people. Wasn't there recently some $20 million plus AI generated impersonation attack that happened? Yeah, that's right. I saw the news uh, a couple of weeks ago, right? We had uh, we had someone in a business who, who transferred a very large sum of money. Uh, yeah, like I think it was $20 million. Uh, thinking that the person on the other end of the video call was was one of their coworkers who you know was asking them to make this transfer, and uh, yeah, you know it was it was an, it was a, a group using uh, an LLM and AI and a deep fake uh, to trick this person. So I think we're going to see more of that probably in the very near future. So do you feel that you know a lot of whether it's brokerages or banks? have this thing they think is very secure called voice verification where they might call you or me and just say, Hey, I want to confirm it's okay. Do you think that's going to go away because it'll be so easy to impersonate voice? I, I think that there's a, there is a race between the detection systems uh, that, that work in that, that voice verification and the attackers and their ability to mimic the voice uh, of, of a legitimate person. So I think we're going to see that, that bar continuing to raise and you're going to find that banks and financial institutions that are often well attacked are going to need to find other ways of authenticating, uh, you know, of authenticating their, uh, their customers. Um, whether that's a, a device they send out to the customer that the customer has to stick into the computer, uh, in order to access their account, or maybe it's some other type of, uh, of, of authentication mechanism, uh, besides, you know, besides the voice, besides a password, besides things that are easy to mimic. As you've come to Roblox, are there any things that are particularly interesting about um, whether the size of our community, the activity, what people are trying to do from a security standpoint that have been you know, interesting for you? Yeah, there are. Um, I, I tell folks this occasionally when I'm trying to explain why Roblox is so unique. You know, there's so much creation that happens here, not only from within the company, but so much of that comes from our community. Um, we have a community of creators, developers who are building experiences, and we have interesting security problems that come through that building, right? We have to, we have to think about the types of attacks that might be successful against our community, not just against the company. Um, and then again, on the far end of that spectrum, you know, as so many people are getting together on Roblox to talk and communicate and play together, um, there are certainly uh, entities like nation states who would love to understand who's getting together, how are they communicating, what are they playing together. Um, so we have that nation state threat at the far end of that. So all that added together really sets up for a unique threat landscape for the business, keeps my team busy and uh, makes it makes it quite fun and challenging. Yeah, and it's interesting because we're talking about security, which overlaps that Venn diagram of safety and civility. So we, we, we have this parallel function that overlaps as far as monitoring safety, what types of communication are happening. And then on the underpinnings of that, all that personal information, all of those creations, we also have to harden from the outside in. So it, it's interesting how it's not just our, our own employees and our own code, but really the the sphere of all our creators that you're protecting. Yeah, you're you're right. We have a a, a really um, really uh, vast moving creator environment, right? We have people that are building stuff every day. That set of things is changing every day. That makes it really challenging. Uh, again, just abs absolutely why this place is is really really cool place to be. You know, on that spectrum from uh, ransomware hospital all the way down, it, it sounds like you must have a lot of judgment because when I was 
when I was younger, hanging out with my young friends, we would play Ding Dong Ditch or something where you'd run around the neighborhood and ring someone's doorbell and hide. And arguably in today's more technically adept society, you know, kids who used to do that might even at a very young age be trying to quote hack into Roblox or, or do stuff. Do, do you see that? And do you have to kind of have that balance of what's the motivation for some of these attacks? Yeah, you do, um, especially in the early, you know, early end of detecting and trying to respond to attacks. Sometimes um, what looks like a, a really well-funded uh, professional hacking organization might actually be a group of, of kids that are just trying to be mischievous. Um, we have to spend time to really understand who's the person that's, that's uh, committing this attack. Who are they? What are their motivation? Um, and then how do we redirect that, right? In some cases, that's very serious criminal activity. And we work with others to help bring that, uh, bring that to justice. But in other cases, it's simply misguided uh, young users on the platform. And we have to figure out how to redirect them to a, uh, a more productive way, hopefully of, hopefully of building on Roblox and making fun experiences. And I, I don't know how far we want to go into this, but there are certain ways we actually try to welcome those people into hardening our community in certain ways at times? Yeah, oh, absolutely. We, we do our best to, uh, to find those folks early and uh, to try to, to redirect their, their activities to things that are, are more helpful to, to the community. And, and when they do have uh, knowledge of, of things that are, are broken at Roblox that we should fix, um, we try to direct them to any, you know, for instance, our bug bounty program, where we uh, where we have a safe way for researchers to give us um, to give us vulnerabilities and and work with us to solve them, uh, and that becomes a great financial motivation for them, but also for some of our young creators, it might start them off a off on a really interesting career. Does that mean if I'm a younger person and I used to try to hack Roblox for showing off to my friends, I could make money doing that if I work with you? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Our bug, our bug bounty program, um, which is, is is public, is certainly the place to go and um, enter that community. If you're going to get into the hacking space and you're going to be testing systems, um, that gives you a, a, a legal and um, I would say even lucrative way of working cooperatively to make the make the product better, make the community better, and help protect uh, others. Uh, well, hey, that sounds pretty cool. Um... Okay, so one of the things we do at Roblox is we both take the long view, but we simultaneously get stuff done. And, and what that means is we, we like to always have a, a vision a few years out and at the same time be shipping stuff every week um, and iterating on the way there. So I'm, I'm going to see if you, you'd be up for stretching um, some way out in the future. You pick it 10, 20, 50 years. What stays the same? in infosec and what changes radically yep um yeah let's say 20 years out let's take the middle of those um yeah i think what we're seeing with ai what we're seeing with ml advancements um these attacks are going to get to be far faster um down to the the minutes and seconds instead of hours and days um i think they're going to get far more voluminous so you're going to see far more attacks coming at the business on a regular basis so there's definitely a race there um, and I think that's only going to increase over the next 20, uh, 20 years. What I think won't change is basic human fallibility. Um, you know, attackers are still going to uh, appeal to, to, feeling, to, to this feeling of wanting to help someone. They're going to appeal to um, really try to pull in the heartstrings of the person that they're trying to uh, attack and compromise. Um, we don't think that's going to change. If I look back, you know, 100 years, those types of attacks were still using the same exact methods. So I don't think that will evolve a lot. Um, I think it means that advancements in InfoSec are likely to come from ways that we can detect human ability, human intuition, motivation. Um, that will probably unlock um, some really interesting scale problem solving for, uh, for my team and for, for other security teams. I, I had a question for you on AI ML that's a little parallel to the voice synthesis. And this is um, you know, there's a lot of questions around deep fakes and AI generated fake images. Uh, I'm going to ask you to go out on a limb and I'll make my prediction, you make yours. When is it just going to become impossible to know 
whether a photograph of a political figure is real or AI generated. Right, right now we can kind of tell, um, but, but my belief is at some point it'll be completely impossible. Yeah. I think it'll be, I think, I think we will get there. Um, especially because you're, you know, the granularity of, of digital, uh, photos, right. And that you're going to get to, uh, a point of, of one to one. I, th I think you're probably talking six to eight years. Um, just, just based on the speed of development. That's, that's my, my predictions. I would say six years. I'm a little optimistic that this isn't going to be such a tragedy because I think it's almost like in 1950 where we really trusted ABC News. Um, da -da -da -da. We may have a resurgence that the only photo you can ever trust is whether you're seeing it, you know, on the web portal or something of an organization you trust. And th there may be actually an opportunity for trust to resurge uh, to, to validate those photos because the, the vast majority we won't be able to trust. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think trust trust is very important in security, um, and I think that uh, anything we can do to build that web of trust around uh, an experience that's been recorded, like a photo, it's going to be important. Uh, it's it's just going to be difficult for uh, your normal you know user on the internet to be able to understand uh, what's real, what's not real, if it's not already quite difficult today. And then going outside of security, you've built an amazing uh, just team and group at Roblox and would love to hear how you think about hiring, how you've you found such amazing people so quickly because the team's exceptional. Um, and I think the, the audience would love to hear your philosophy. Yeah, um, we have built, the, the team and I have built up quite, quite quickly um, over the last couple of years that I've been here. And um, there are a few things we're looking for. Um, because, uh, because we're being attacked from all over the world and with lots of different people, we're really focused on bringing people to the team that have a real diversity of experiences and backgrounds because it allows them to look at our systems with different angles and to find, um, uh, vulnerabilities that we might not have thought of with the existing team. So we're really thinking about casting a very wide net, finding people who not only have worked in, you know, our peer, uh, tech companies, but who also have worked in very other, very different other industries, right? We don't want to be that healthcare industry we were talking about earlier. We want to make sure that we've got a little bit of that knowledge from across that spectrum. So really when it comes to hiring, it's about making sure that we're getting very, very diverse points of view. Um, that and making sure that we're, we're finding folks who really like to build solutions. Um, we're, we're definitely not, you know, the organization that, that gives you a list of things you need to not do. We really want to come in and build the solutions to help be the, the safety net when things fail, uh, that gives you that multi-layer, uh, approach to security. So really finding builders from very, you know, different backgrounds. I think that's the cornerstone of our hiring philosophy. Yeah. In a way that mirrors a bit, the responsibility we have when we have people from all backgrounds, cultures, ages on our platform within our company as a whole, having the ability to empathize with our user base mirrors a bit with that need for diverse backgrounds and points of view within our whole company. Um, uh, and then a final thought here for you, both we love to be optimis optimistic and we're optimistically bringing together people from around the world, but you in a way have to be thinking all the time about um, things that could go wrong. Do you, how are you, are you able to balance optimism with that thinking about this? Yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. I, I think it's challenging in security. You're always thinking about what could go wrong. What's the worst case scenario. Um, but when you really focus on the folks that you're there to protect, you really focus on, um, that community that you're keeping safe. Um, I think it, it helps you think about, yeah, this is the, this is the great thing that I want to be sure keeps going and grows. Um, so you really have to have that positive point of view and really look for that end outcome that you want to happen. And, uh, that keeps the team motivated, keeps us from getting too, uh, too depressed around the, the negative things that are likely to happen on the way to uh, being successful. Well, Brooks, just hearing your, your kind of broad view of this, both on human vulnerability mixed with the technology and the optimism mixed with the viewing forward, you may have inspired 
many, many people today, that security is a lot cooler than anyone ever imagined. So uh, I think there might be a lot of budding security engineering type leaders out there who are listening to the show. I certainly hope so. It's a really interesting field, very fast moving field, and uh, one that brings a, a lot of, of interesting problems for people who like to, to solve puzzles. Absolutely. Well, hey, Brooks, thank you so much for being on the show. It was really exciting and a pleasure to be with you today. Thanks, Dave. I really appreciate the, the, the time and uh, getting to dive into this topic. And that's all for another episode of Tech Talks. Thanks for listening. And if you'd like to find out more about Roblox, check out corp.roblox.com. I'm your host, Dave Bazuki. See you again next time.